Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Hank Strange. Today we have Sam Andrews of Andrews Custom Leather. We haven't done one of these in a while. This is going to be a how it's made video. Exactly what are we showing how you make it today? Well, today we're going to look at the Monarch shoulder holster system. You and I have reviewed it a right. time or two before. Yes, we've done several videos. Because of that, I am making a lot of those shoulder holsters, and it's That's all good. your fault. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Forgive <then> me. <laughs> many of your viewers have expressed some interest in seeing how those are made. Right. And as it's now one of the most popular things that we're doing, we're going to, might as well do it. We'll walk you through all the steps, so if you want to, you can even make your own. <laughs> Don't try it. Don't try this at all. <laughs> so my understanding is this is at least three different parts here. I think we're talking the rig, the holster, and, um, and then a, a mag pouch, right? Magazine right pouch. There's the holster, the harness, and the magazine pouch. So the okay. three main components of the Monarch shoulder system. Okay, so what does it, just give me like a brief... Uh, you know, explanation of what you're going to be doing here before oh, we sure. jump into it. Well, first we're going to be cutting out the pieces, doing things like the lining and the edging, assembling it all, stitching it up, and then the final, we mold it for shape and then color them. Oh, okay. So if you're making this holster for a particular customer, about how long does it take normally? Is it, is it hours, days? There are hours involved in the actual assembly, but as I'm never making just one at a time, Right. Uh, there can be weeks between order and delivery, just depending on where we are in the production cycle. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's jump into it. Now, what different types of leathers are you using for this build? Well, this one we're doing in regular cowhide, even though I make so many exotic skin things, this is still the bulk of what I do. Okay. I'm cutting the holster body out of 7 8 ounce leather, and okay. the magazine pouches out of 6 7. Okay, where do you get those from? These hides are from Wicket and Craig, which is a tannery up in Pennsylvania. It's the same family, been 140 years tanning. They just do beautiful, flawless hides. I get them from them or from a distributor in California, the Hide House, we get from both sources. Okay. But it's marvelous stuff and there's very little waste. Okay, so for all the guys out there that are looking for a place to get oh, their leather, Wicket they, and they Craig? can't do better. Okay, Wicket and Craig in Pennsylvania. Right. Now, the way I cut these, because I make so many of them, I had clicker dies made, which are like a big cookie cutter for leather. Using these clicker dies makes cutting so much easier. They are consistent every time, everything fits together, really cuts down on the steps in production. This one cuts out an outline. This one for the magazine pouch not only cuts out the outline, but it puts in the center hole, holes for the snaps really eats up on the time required. So we'll go over here to the clicker press. Notice the similarity in names. And you place the die on the leather where you want it to cut. And as it's going to shear right down through, it allows me to look in and check for any flaws, scars, any marks on the hide itself. Now this will be a little noisy. I have to turn on the phase converter because the machine works on three phase and there's only single phase wired in here. Takes a moment to warm up, it's a hydraulic machine. Got to get up to pressure. Once it's up and running, you press the button simultaneously, which is a safety so you don't leave a hand down on the cutting surface. Shears through everything in one go. Perfect cuts every time. Now I'm changing for a different weight of leather for the other pieces. The magazine pouch and the belt loop for the holster. Again, I can examine right down through the die and make sure it's all good. Now, as this is a larger die, 
sometimes it takes two punches for the greater surface area. I need to turn it up a bit. There we go. That loud pop tells me it cut through. Last loop, the belt loop and also mounting for the hardware. I cut through in one go as it's a smaller piece. And we can turn off the noisy machine. Using the cutting dies allows me to get a perfect cut each time, all consistent, all the same, so I can have my assembly minions cutting and putting things together for me to sew, and I know they're all going to fit. Won't have one larger than the other. Now we need to click out the material for the harness itself. That's a different leather than I use for the holsters on the magazines. This is a heavy garment leather. It's also cowhide, but it was processed in a different way than the other things that we use for the harder pieces. This is very malleable, and it's got a suede inside and a smooth outside. The reason that's important is the suede inside grabs onto me when I'm wearing the rig so it doesn't slide around. And having the smooth outer surface lets my cover garment slide over without bunching up and betraying its presence. These are similarly cut with the dies. The dies are long, so I've got to turn this so that the machine head will cover the entire die. In the interest of keeping bulk low, the Monarch butterfly piece itself is cut from a slightly lighter version of the same leather. These butterfly pieces for the harness, you need to cut two of those as it creates a front and a back to capture the strap in between. And when you're clicking, you jigsaw the shapes together as closely as possible to waste minimal amount of material. That's another nice thing about the die cutting is you can place them very closely as all the force is coming down directly from above. You've got the big machine to cut, you know, the die cutter here. Right. Obviously, we've done other videos before, but just real quickly for the folks out there that want to do this on their own, mm -hmm. what would they do if they don't have the big machine? Oh, well, still an enormous amount of my work I end up hand cutting because dies are expensive and you're only going to have those made for things you're doing a lot of. And so for anything else, I have a paper pattern. I trace it in pen on the leather and then cut it out using my carpet behind knife method which we showed on the other videos. Once the pieces are cut, I need to mark with the paper pattern where the holes and the stitching marks go to. So I just line this up around the edge, make sure it's all even. Draw in the holes that I'll need to punch. And for my stop and stop marks on the stitching, I just push with the point of the pen and that gives me a little dimple in the leather that tells me where to start from, where to stop. Similarly with the belt loop, it aligns the holes for the snaps, shows me where to put the slot for the belt, and the stitching marks, which before I sew I will connect them with my ruler, 
so I can just follow the lines along with the stitching machine. The magazine pouch is much simpler. It pretty well sizes itself as it goes together. I just need to put in the bottom stitching line and mark where the slot gets cut. And now these are ready to take to the next step. Now I need to place the holes in the holster body for the hardware to fit into, such as the snap on the end of the strap, the hole for the T-nut, which is going to reinforce the hardware in the belt loop area, and the other screw post which will hold down the tab for the rear D-ring. After I punch them through from the top side, I turn it over and I back punch them from within, so I get the leather flowing outward in the direction that the hardware is going to be placed in it. So it comes out to its maximum height. From here we've got the pieces cut out and now it's time to assemble them. We're going to first line the holster body with the suede and do the edging on the magazine pouch and the belt loop. I used the lead weight to hold the leather in place while I cut out the suede lining. It acts as a third hand so the thing isn't sliding all over the place. I cut out the suede with an extra wide margin so that when I go to trim it after the gluing I have something to hold on to. Before I can line this though, I need to put the hardware in that everything is going to attach to. So moving over here, where I have the anvil, at this point we need to install the hardware that we punched the holes for. In this hole here, a T-nut goes, which has these prongs to sink into the leather, keeps it from spinning when it's in place. As this holster is going to fold over at the top, I want to cut a flat edge on one side of the T-nut so that when the holster folds, the leather's not getting tented up right in the middle, which could be a wear point. I place the T-nut in the leather over this hole on my anvil so I can drive it through and tap it into place. Now this will hold and it won't spin when we tighten the screw. The other hardware that I need to adjust is the base for the snap. It's fully rounded. I nip off a little piece on one side to flatten. Since on a 1911 being carried cocked and locked, the thumb safety is in the upper on position, I cut this little divot out of the end of the strap so that when it's in place, it creates a hollow that will not push the safety off. But because that's bringing the edge closer to the hole, I just nip the edge off the snap so it doesn't extend too far for the stitching. The next step is to glue the holster body and the lining together. In order to glue the lining to the body of the leather, I use the barge cement, which is an extraordinarily strong glue, but dangerous chemicals you want to use it in a really well ventilated area. If I'm doing a lot of gluing, I'll have the exhaust fan on, maybe even a fan blowing past me from the floor. This is stuff you don't want to breathe very long. I always stroke it outward from the center when I'm getting to the edges, because if I came inward, it could peel off glue and put it on the edge, and that would interfere with edging and slicking later on. We get a nice even coat all over. Once the holster face is glued, I apply the same glue to the interior of the suede for lining. This is a contact cement and bonds best to itself. So having it on both surfaces 
and a nice even coat gives you an incredibly strong bond. In fact, when I've had to take pieces apart because they were misaligned, the leather usually tears before the glue apart. So I know it's going to hold for a long, long time. Now we give that a couple of minutes to get tacky before we place the pieces together. The hardware that goes in the holster is the snap post on the end of the thumb brake strap and I've aligned that little flat place with the edge of the divot so I can actually sew around it. And a screw post here in the tailpiece where it's going to hold the rear D-ring once everything is assembled. On these unlined parts, which I'll work with while the glue is getting tacky, I first take my straight edge and I connect the stitching marks on the belt loop. After which, everything that's not going to be sewn needs a groove line, which both acts as a stitching guide and as a decorative edge where there's going to be no stitching. When I try to teach people these methods, one of the hardest things they deal with is the grooving. And the secret on the grooving is don't try to turn the tool, turn the work. Because you want to be always pulling just about straight toward you. In this place, I've come down to the corner here, I keep the groover in the same place and I just turn the leather. And that way I don't end up with a shaky line. Sometimes I go over a cut twice to define it. Usually it cuts a nice groove in one pass. Now that the glue's had a chance to get tacky, we can put the pieces together. I always bring the holster straight in down from the top, looking down on the pieces so that I can make sure that I've got good glue edge all around where the leather is going to bond because if I had any dry suede, it wouldn't adhere very well, the two parts. Then with my thumbs, just press down the edges to get them to stick. And because I don't want anything coming apart, I take this smooth piece of plastic and I rub it down from the back side, from the suede side, to really bond the materials around the edge. You can see the edge start to show through the suede as a rub on it. That way you won't have anything peeling off with use. And now we've got lining. At this point we need to trim off the lining even with the body of the holster. I put it off the edge of the table so my blade can pass through. I put my lead here to just stabilize it and keep it in place. I slightly pull the suede out to make it taut and just follow the edge of the leather around with the side of my knife. I'm being careful to cut straight along it and not to turn it inside. We don't want to take any chunks out of the side of the leather itself. If in the trimming you come to a tough place where you can't just push the blade forward, use a slight slicing motion and that will usually up through the obstruction. The 
The next thing we need to do to the pieces that are not lined is to bevel the edges to get away from the square side that the clicking leaves on one edge. When the clicker die shears through the leather, it rounds off the top edge that it's come through, but that leaves a sharp and rather ragged edge on the inside. So using the beveling tool, which is sort of a sm small U-shape with a sharp interior, we can take off that edge and round everything, making it more consistent and getting rid of the fuzz. This is another area where turning the work rather than the tool is helpful because you're usually pushing straight away from yourself with the beveler. Anytime you break your wrist and try to go at an awkward angle, you lose control. So I try as often as possible to just cut in a line straight away from myself and turn the work to follow. Now the reason that I'm beveling in some places and not in others is these places that I'm beveling are going to be standalone edges which will be dressed and smoothed. The other pieces where I'm not beveling are going to be brought together and joined so we don't want to bevel that which would create a gap in between the two pieces. People are always asking me about where to get particular tools. These are the new professional craft tool bevelers from Tandy and I've been very very pleased with them. They come in a variety of sizes for the depth of bevel that you're going to do. They're very very sharp, they've got a nice angle to work with and they get into corners much better than the old V-style bevelers. The next step is to slick the edge where we've beveled it to get that nice rounded smooth surface. So I dampen it with water And first I used the arbor on this slicking machine to get all the fibers laying in one direction. I'll go over it and slick it by hand afterward to get the really tight mirror polish on it. But this is a great time saver, especially when you're doing 50 or 100 of something. Every minute you save really counts. Another trick I learned is to always slick it in the direction that later you're going to apply the edge coat so that everything is running the same way. When you're pulling the edge coat dauber over the edge, it's not trying to bring up the fibers that were laid down in the opposite direction. For anybody who doesn't have a slicking machine, you can do perfectly good work with the hand tools only. I use the machine as a time saver because I'm never just doing one of anything. But using 
A slicking wheel, again available from Tandy or other leather craft supplies. Once the leather's been dampened, that gives you the rounded, smooth, slick edge. I use a little pen, just a plastic pen, to get into the corners, which are too small for the wheel itself. And that does a very nice job. This is still damp enough, so I don't need to apply more water from when we were using it on the machine. And I check it with my thumb. I'm looking for that glassy, glassy, smooth edge. It's all done by feel. And then in the tight little inside spaces, by angling the pen, I can get that same rounding. And continue on with the wheel. Now that we have the slicking accomplished, we need to put on the maker's mark and punch some extra holes using these tools. Now that we have the belt loop slicked, we need to place the holes in it for the hardware to pass through. Now that we have all the holes in there, the maker's mark goes on, slightly dampening the leather so that it will take a deep impression. I use this stamp which has the name reversed, put it right about in the middle, and I use this dead blow hammer because it won't bounce, and we get a very clean impression. Because we're going to be folding this together to sew it, I'll place these snaps in the holes now. It'll be more difficult to get to once it's put together. The post comes up through the hole and the snap stud fits down over that. Place the snap setting tool in the middle, which will flare that central portion and hold it in place. Now that we have all the holes placed, the maker's mark on, time to attach the belt loop to the holster body and prepare for stitching. For the next assembly, I'm going to dampen these pieces that need to be bent sharply to hold the hardware. I do a little bit inside and outside only in a thin band because I don't want water getting where I'm going to place the glue. These two tabs on the magazine pouch bend over to hold the D-rings. And they extend down inside to where the leather will fold over and cover. That way when they're stitched it will go through all three layers. Then the belt loop for the holster itself gets bent over to hold the hardware that it attaches to the harness with. A little bit of glue, keep it in place. And I'm also going to attach the thumb brake stiffener, which is this piece of stainless steel. I will go in there, 
That way when the thumb pushes on the thumb brake, you don't get the leather flex. The steel helps the snap to brake all in one motion. Next, now that the glue is tacky enough to hold, we get everything bent around. I want these holes to line up on the D-ring holder so that my hardware will go through without binding. And we place the thumb brake stiffener right here in the middle, making sure that I have adequate stitching room all around. Because while my sewing machine is very strong, trying to stitch through stainless steel challenges it. Try to avoid that. We're doing the same process with the magazine pouch, getting the D-rings in place, and bringing the inner edge down low enough that when I stitch two rows of stitching across, it won't be falling off the edge. The double rows will go through there for extra strength on the stress points. press down to get them really holding. Now on this magazine pouch, it's designed to be bent in half. So again, I'm putting a little water where I want the leather softened in order to bend without cracking. Getting these edges lined up. Let's give it a squeeze and a little wiggle. And now it will hold in position. Whoops. This glue was not cooperating here. Press it a little harder. There. Now it's staying. Now we'll lay a bead of glue along the top on both sides where it's going to join and along the bottom edge. Now you can draw a glue guideline on so you don't go too far. I've done this 10 million million times and so <laughs> I'm very comfortable just doing it by eye. But you don't want the glue to extend down in where the magazines are going to run because that makes them rather hard to withdraw. On the holster itself, before I can set this on and glue it in place for stitching, I need to get a hole for my thumb brake snap because that's rather important. It keeps the gun in place. So I place this on with the hardware lining up in the hole and using a pencil, because I don't want to leave noticeable marks, I trace around to give me a glue guide and I angle the pencil so that the mark goes underneath. You don't want any guidelines showing on top of the finished product. I then just connect these dots here this is the area the belt is going to run up through, so we certainly don't want any glue there, just around the outer edge. I also mark here where my snap hole is going to go, so everything will line up. Now having punched the holes for the snaps to line up in, I've counterpunched it from the interior suede side so that the socket of the snap can sit flush below surface so it's not going to rub on the weapon as you place it in the holster. These now get glued within the lines that I've previously marked.
I don't know if you can see the guidelines on the holster. They're very faint pencil lines. As I said, I don't want them showing. But they're easy enough to detect and keep the glue within the lines. Very much like kindergarten art class. Stay within the lines. And in a moment they'll be tacky and ready for assembly. After we've got the glue tacky enough to assemble, we're going to put these together and then I like to tap it again with a dead blow hammer, rubber face so it won't mark the leather, on my little shop anvil piece of railroad iron here. That way they won't shift when I'm trying to stitch them. Now that I've got it assembled, I like to give it a little persuasion with the dead blow hammer. That way everything is firmly joined. In case I let the glue get too dry before assembly, this makes sure it's all adhering. When assembling the holster parts, the most critical thing is to get the snap holes aligned so that the small hole centers in the large one. So I look to that first. Next, I make sure that the hole over the hardware centers up. From there, everything else follows. I get the edges evening, just pressing it with thumb pressure at this point. And then I lay the rest of the belt loop down over the glue and again persuade it to stay in place. It doesn't take a lot of beating, this just makes the glue get a firm, firm grip on itself. Now as a further guide for the stitching, I'm going to connect the grooves that I previously began around the edges. This not only helps me keep a consistent width from the edge with my stitching, but it creates a little trough for the stitches to sit down in so they're not humped up over the surface of the leather. Earlier when marking on the holster itself, we put the stop and the start marks for the stitching on there. This tells me where to begin the groove, carry it around all the edges to be stitched. Again, I move the work instead of the groover so that I can keep just pulling the groover directly toward myself. It gives a lot more control. Now we're going to stitch these things on my old Landis number no. 16 harness maker. It was built in the early part of the 20th century as a harness saddlery machine. And for me, there's no modern machines that can stitch as well. It has an awl that makes the hole in the leather from above. The needle comes up through the pre-made hole from below and catches the thread in the hook on the end of it to take it down and lock the stitch. This can do amazingly thick and heavy leather. Basically, if you can fit it under the presser foot, you can sew it. So much more able than most modern machines on the very heavy materials.
I'm back stitching from the ends a couple of stitches. This is to prevent the stitches from pulling loose on the ends in the single row of stitching. Now we're going to trim off the thread after stitching. I like to use this little scalpel because it gets right down in the hole. This way you don't leave any tufts of thread sticking out. On the inside I'll just take it off flush because it's all going to get flattened and glued together. Now they're ready for the next step. Now we're going to sand the edges where more than one layer has been put together and get it all true and even before beveling.
To get into the tight little places which are too small for the large belt sander, we use the spindle sander, which is actually a drill press with a couple of sanding drums <laughs> attached to a bolt. Crude, but it works. Now that we've got the edges sanded true, it's time to bevel it and round off the very square edge that the sanding has left. I like to use the larger number three beveler on the inside on the suede edge. It takes off a good amount and that's the edge that I want to get a really good round rolled finish on. I'm having to do this on the edge of the table because the hardware is going to make this wobble if I try to do it flat. So I set that off the edge, which allows me to flatten out the leather that I'm actually pressing down on. Now some of these corners are too tight for any of the bevelers, so I just go in with the knife, take the curve there, and continue on with the beveler. Sometimes I'll come back and do a slightly flatter angle in case there's a ridge. I can feel a little ridge, square ridge there. And this gets off just a bit more leather because we want that nice rounded edge. On the outside, on the hard smooth leather side, I'll use a smaller, either number one or number two beveler. This doesn't take off too much. And on this outer edge, I don't need more than just a slight breaking of the square cross-section and then when slicked together they make a nice rounded hole. Here I've got two layers of leather together so I'm going to use the bigger number two and as with all beveling, I try to turn the work and not the tool itself to get a greater control. Again, you have to do gentle knife work in those tight corners as the beveler has these extensions, these tines or feet, which will dig into the leather if you try to take it into too sharp a kern. The same is true on the magazine pouch. I've got some square edges left over from the sanding. So just beveling off the edges. I don't have to do a very deep or heavy cut as this leather is somewhat thinner than the holster leather. Makes all the edges flow together. And I always check it with a finger. It can look right, but still not feel right. There, 
nicely rounded both sides. Now that we've got the edges all sanded and beveled, time to slick them and get that high polish hard edge on it. As with the slicking earlier, the edge needs to be wet. And I always slick them in the direction that I'm going to apply the edge coat when we get to the finishing stage. And I always do the finger check. From here, we do the hand slicking to get that final mirror polish, and then it's almost assembled. To do the hand slicking, I dampen the leather again. You don't want it too wet, but it can't be dry. And I give the leather edge a rub down, following what the machine started, but this gives that final hard, smooth, packed in slick leather edge. The round wooden handle of any of the tools makes a dandy slicker. I just come at it from a couple angles, sort of bent over, straight on, and then under to get the rounding on the edge. Now, sometimes when you do hard slicking, you'll mushroom the edge a bit. It'll create a raised ridge. To get rid of that, again, I just use the smooth piece of plastic. I just press it down firmly against the table, and that gets rid of any ridge which may have been raised by the action of the slicking. I continue the same process with the holster. Continually do the finger check. That's going to tell you when you've got it to the right smoothness. I know it may look like I'm just rubbing back and forth, but really I'm applying the pressure more in one direction than the other, because I want to keep the flow, the fibers laying down, all going in the same direction, but later I'm going to apply the edge coat. Again, the pen makes a marvelous tool for getting into the tight little corners and places where the larger ones won't fit. And I can feel that I mushroomed that edge just a little bit. So, press it down. I 
I don't know if it's visible on video, but the really polished edge takes on almost a shine. It reflects the light a bit. That's why we call it a mirror polish. At this point, it's time to install the final hardware. Firstly, I put in screw to the T-nut we installed earlier. Here, where the holster is going to hang all the way to the gun on the D-ring, it's doubled over and stitched down, but I'm not a trusting soul. I want suspenders with the belt in this case. So, place the screw in, get that snug down, and now the holster will break before that will come apart. Now to install the snaps for the thumb brake system, first to put the stud over the post, tap it firmly into place. I try to spin it. If I can't spin the snap, I know it's firmly set. The socket goes in next, and as this is a directional snap, it's got a little lip on that inner edge. That has to be positioned so it faces in towards the pocket where the gun is going because it's preventing opening from the inside. I use this all to pry it in, make sure it's really set down tightly in. Get the snap stud in there. Line it up. Press it down. Everything straight. Now that's set and in position, there's a little lip or foot that comes off the bottom of the snap that's pushed into the leather on the top so this will not spin. It keeps its position. Now it's time to bring the holster together and form the actual gun pocket. Where I'm going to bend it, I dampen it across where it's going to crease because leather that's too dry can crack if you overstress it. So this gives it the elasticity we're going to need. I give it a bit of a squeeze to hold that bend and bring in the glue. Again, you can write a guideline in for where the glue goes, but I've just done so many, many of these. And it's easier just to draw the shape in with the glue and do it by eye. Now the glue is tacky enough, I can bring the edges together, line up everything, and get it all set for final stitching. And to make sure it stays in place, a little extra persuasion. Now for stitching, I first want to make my groove along the edge. Once that's there, I can put on this guide trace I made which I align with the edge, and that shows me exactly where the stitches need to go on the face of it. Trace it out with the pen, and then I will stitch right over the pen line to close the holster up. Now we have one final stitching operation, and the holster will all be assembled.
Now the holster is all assembled, but it's still flat, can't get the weapon into it. So the final step is the molding. We're going to fit it by first immersing the holster in water to soften the leather. Then we'll use one of these dummy guns and a press and some hand tools. The nice thing about leather is its plastic quality. It's moldable and it has memory. Once it has a shape in there, it keeps that shape. So I get this placed in, make sure it's really seated all the way. I snap the thumb brake around. I should note this one is made to carry the weapon cocked and locked. I do the holsters for the 45s either for cocked and locked or I use a longer strap if somebody wants to carry with the hammer down so people can specify which one they like. I pry up the edge of the leather here so that I can get this tapered dowel driven in along the top. This is creating a tunnel for the front sight to ride in when the holster is all molded. Now that the mold is in place, the dowel is in for the sight track, I can place it in the press. I use these sheets of gum rubber to cover the holster so there's no transfer between the black neoprene foam and the leather. Without those, sometimes you can get some dark marks in the leather itself. years of doing it, I've just found out from the pressure I'm feeling on the handle when it's about at the right depth. Now I'm going to leave it in there for a few minutes and let the leather really form around the gun dummy, at which point I'll take it out and do the final molding. We've taken the holster out of the press. The press has done 80% of the shaping. I could dry it and use it as it is, but it doesn't have the deep incised lines and shape of the weapon in the leather yet. And to do that, we need to bone it. First, I want to put in this wedge to create the sight tunnel and apply it with the wax stick. This is the new wax stick. The old one gave up the ghost. It split after many years of faithful service. I used these two tools for the boning, one I call the beaver tail and then the needle point. They're just polished off pieces of wood attached to these dowels. This gives me better torque control. Traditionally, boning was done with bits of antler and polished bone, hence the name. But the polished wood works just as well. And while the leather is wet, it's in its moldable state. We can get all the gun shape showing through. And when it dries, it will have a perfect fit. I always mold a very tall sight tunnel in these holsters because a lot of the night sights and high profile sights are going to stand up tall. I don't want anything to be catching on the edge of the leather. I detail the ejection port but when I take the gun dummy out of the leather, I like to reach in 
my finger and push the leather back up a little bit, I don't want it molded down so hard that it creates a, a lock that makes the gun difficult to withdraw. That's especially true with Glocks and SIGs, which have very, very sharp edges to the ejection port. Not so much the 1911, but it's just a good practice with any of the weapons. The flat side of the beaver tail is useful to lay down the leather against the slide and other flat surfaces and then the rounded end <laughs> is good for getting into the corners and outlining. The needlepoint one helps me highlight the lines and make them more precise. The larger beaver tail is good for general shaping, but can't do the detail. The flat side of it also works well as an eraser to get rid of extra tool marks which you don't want to leave. And I open up the belt loop and put this form through so that if you do want to wear it as a high ride on the belt you won't have to struggle getting your belt through the flat place. Lastly, I bend over this tab, which is going to hold the D-ring on the back of the holster. And just open up this area where the tension retainer is going to go. It makes it easier to install. This holster is now ready to go out in the sun and dry for a day, at which point it will be ready for the finishing table in color. At this point, the holster is dry, but not getting toasty in the sun. Before I put on the oil finish for color, I want to put on the edge coat, which is a flexible enamel sealer that keeps the edge nice and hard and tight, doesn't let the fibers come up with use. I apply it with the dauber, and if you remember, I emphasized always slicking in one direction. That was so when I go to put on the edge coat, and I draw the dauber across it, all the fibers are laying down in that direction. I'm not pulling them back up like this. I use a shell as a spacer to keep the wet edges apart so it doesn't mark the lining or anywhere I don't want the edge coat to be. So many good uses for empty shell cases. Absolutely. You don't want this dauber to be too wet, just basically damp with the edge coat for control because you don't want it gobbing up or running. All your good work at this point is ruined if it runs down across the face of the holster.
hitch coat now being on it only takes about five or ten minutes to dry it's very quick drying after which point we can apply the oil for the color on the magazine pouch I'm doing a little touch up where the edge coat was slightly thin it's better to put on two light coats than try to do it too heavy all in one as I say there's a danger of it running and getting out of control there that's pretty now the edge coat is dry on the holster I can apply the oil for color this is the Neats Foot Oil compound which Feebings makes. I like the compound better than raw Neats Foot Oil. It isn't as thick and heavy, seems to soak in better, and I get this lovely russet color. Especially after they've dried in the sun, it seems to tan it a little bit darker than just letting it dry in a, a hot box or at room temperature. A lot of people have commented on how they really like the rich color this turns them. The Neats Foot Oil also has the property, being that it's an oil, of making the leather more waterproof and sweatproof than a dyed finish. The oil in the leather won't let the water penetrate. That's one good starting coat. I'll let that dry in and it may take several more coats over time before the color stays the same. This is actually going to lighten up a great deal just from a first coat. So we'll apply more, get it to the right color, and then we'll spray on the final finish. The magazine pouch as well gets its dose of oil. And it's important to make them match when you're doing a set that's going to be used together. That's why it's best to finish them at the same time so you can get the shades to the same color. Because having a really light holster and a dark pouch would look awkward. Now that we've got the oil on here, we'll get it to consistent color along with the holster and then be able to spray on the final finish and assemble. Now I'm ready to apply the final finish. I use the acrylic resoline. It dries very clearly, waterproofs, and gives it a soft shine. It's a great finish. And by applying it with an airbrush, I don't end up with these streaks and lines that a, a physical brush or a dauber would do. Plus, I find the daubers shed tiny little wool bits which get stuck in the finish, and that doesn't really enhance anything. Again, with this, I like to do a lighter coat and then wait and see. Maybe I shoot a little more on if I shoot too much, it starts to pool up and run. So less is more, better to do it in two applications. Now that all the pieces are made, dried, and finished, we go for the final assembly and attach it to the harness so we can actually wear it. First, we need to attach the D-ring in the rear tab so we have something for the harness to hold on to. that screw snug down good and tightly so it won't come loose. Next I put the tensioner in that will hold from below the trigger guard. I like to run the awl through the holes make sure everything is lined up and opened so I don't have to struggle with the hardware. This has the screw post and also the clip and D for the lower back strap to attach to. It's sometimes tricky getting the first threads to catch on that. Get to 
fool with the angles as I'm sort of doing it blind. Ah, there we go. Well, when this is assembled, by tightening or loosening the screw, it expands or contracts the rubber grommet inside for how tightly it grips the weapon. Now that we have all the harness pieces on to attach, we can make the harness go on. I use these aluminum screw posts, known as Chicago screws, for the adjustment. I like the aluminum because it's inert. Unlike brass, it's not going to get that green goo on it from sweat and storage. They're very strong and they lay flat. The harness is adjusted for how it rides on the person by undoing those and moving them up and down in the holes available for the height and the angle that you want the holster to ride. Yep. Getting the first thread started on these can sometimes be tricky. The magazine pouch attaches in the same way through the D-ring back up behind now I'm setting these finger tight because everybody's going to adjust for themselves once they get their rig once you've found perfect adjustment where it's very, very comfortable, it's not a bad idea to put some thread locker in these. I found Elmer's white glue or fingernail polish works wonderfully, and you can still horse it apart if you need to detach it for any reason. The last piece to put on is the lower back strap. This attaches between the bottom edge of the magazine pouch and the bottom edge of the holster. And on this system, it replaces the tie downs, which would normally attach to a belt on many of these designs. With the lower back strap, it negates the need for those. It also prevents the holster from swinging outward or forward. It helps hold it into the body and it keeps the holster in place when you're drawing the weapon so it doesn't try to follow the gun. Now this Monarch rig is fully assembled and I'll ask Hank if he won't help me model the finished product. Now that we have the rig all assembled and together, I've asked Hank to be my model here and demonstrate how it carries. Yeah, so I'm a little bit of a plus size model, but happy to do it. You know, got to represent for the plus size models out it's there. It's got a lot of adjustments. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. So it feels good. It's hot off the, the presses or the hands, so to speak. Well, it distributes the weight. It doesn't bind you in any place. Right. When you, you move around, right, you have freedom of over. movement. It's moving with me. Yeah. This is, my, this is me doing turn it around and show people your vulnerable side. Yeah. With the lower back strap, lean forward. Nothing moves. Right. Locks up, keeps in place. It's like a vest closed on three sides. Right. Now we're using my aluminum dummy gun for the demo since you sweep a wide area with a right. cross draw. So what would be the adjustment points on this holster for someone once they get it in the so, mail? Well, once you get it, put it on, and it really helps you have another person there to help you with the, mm -hmm. the doing and undoing. You just need to move them up or down in the holes, move the screw binders, mm -hmm. until it feels comfortable it's not choking up in the armpit, and it's presented far enough forward that your hand will fall naturally on the weapon. You don't right. want to be groping. Right, yeah, you can easily just go there and exactly. get it up, right, okay. 
And basically, it's you work it until it's comfortable. Yeah, and I noticed that you know the gun's not going to fall out of there without that's, the strap either. That's the so. tensioner under the trigger guard. Okay. It's the belt and suspenders method. Yeah. Because this, if something ever hit the thumb brake accidentally and opened it, you're going to still there until you pull on it. Yeah. And you can adjust how tightly yeah. you want. And it. I noticed the minute I put my thumb there, it just won't. It's easy it's to, open. which is supposed to do, so that you do that exactly. and you get that release. You've got to practice this, I know. So there's, you know, let's see how, let's see how good I am here. So you go in, pull it out, right? Yeah. Right. So, so now the thumb brake. Yeah. against the tensioner. Right, so and you said when you put it back in, make sure you've got it all the way Lock in. it all the way in. Put this over, start from the edge, lock it in. And it. so on the drawer, you want to go in with your thumb and just move yeah. that. Hit the thumb. But don't right. lock your thumb in there. Right. And then pull it, it out. It makes an easy withdrawal if you don't right. hold the thumb down yeah. on the snap. Just like with, it, with any holster, you want to practice nice. what you're doing. How to get it back in and look smooth. <laughs> Do it. Looking good. Cool, yes. Yeah, so. There, there you go. go. Right. Okay. Yes. And now we've deployed our deadly aluminum. We're dangerous. Right. Very good. I know there's a lot. This is probably one of your more complicated rigs because it's got so many There's a lot more parts. steps that go into this than in the other ones that we demonstrated how to make, which are simple standalone holsters. Right. Exactly. Uh, this is more of a system than a single holster. Absolutely. And you'll probably notice that I'm in a completely different outfit because this is day two. It took us two days to get this done. I think it takes you a little bit longer when you're putting these together. But... Oh, well, I'm never making just one thing at a time. I'm building these by the dozens and along yeah. with everything else. Right. Absolutely. So before we get out here, I don't know if there's any other things you wanted to say, but I think we should address some of the videos that we've done. Very good. You know, very popular videos on my channel. People love to see how you make this stuff. I'm very gratified that yeah. they like it. So many comments. And Sam's not really like a uh, technology, I don't know how to put it. Think in dinosaur. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm at home with dial phones, things like that. Yeah. But he does every now and then drop in and look at all the comments and stuff like that. And we try to get back, get you guys answers. We both really appreciate, I think, all the attention. Very, very much appreciate it. Absolutely. And we're going to try to keep doing more. This That's is one of those. Allows. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a lot of ideas of stuff to do. And now you've moved to St. Augustine as well. Right. The new bigger shop, the new location. Right. Much more efficient. The old shop, which you saw in the last videos, was getting pretty crowded. Yeah. <laughs> This is probably like five, six times bigger. Did you change phone numbers? Because I know that's the way people need to make their orders with you. So what's going on there? We have a new phone number. We have okay. an address. Everything is on the website. Okay. So it's all, right. all accurate as far as getting in touch with Okay. What is the number? Because that's one thing, a uh, comment that people make a lot. They ask questions on the YouTube videos because they think you can, you're going to directly answer that. Mm -hmm. So the phone number is the absolutely best way to get through to Sam. Mm -hmm. And if you can't get through, just keep calling him. That's, <laughs> that's what I do. He's got no cell phone or anything else. So just keep calling him. What's the number? The new number is 904-679-4997. And that's where I am almost every waking hour. That's the best way to get in touch. Yeah, so I know that's like old tech for everyone out there, but <laughs> give him a call. That's the best way. If you have questions, you want to make an order, etc. don't keep him on the phone too long because there's guys waiting to get their holsters. There's a lot of work he's doing. <laughs> right, absolutely. Okay, Sam, I, you know, this was great. I always learn something every time I come in. Well, Have fun, hang out with you guys. Showing off the work. Absolutely, and St. Augustine's beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. We miss you guys in Gainesville. I used to just be able to go around the corner, and there you were, but, you know, it's fun coming out here. Gives you a reason to drop. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. All right, I, do you remember how I end my videos? Been oh, yes. time. Okay. First, I remind people that That's they have to, like, I'm comment, jumping ahead. like the videos, share, all that good stuff, tell their friends about us. And then subscribe, of course. And then finally, I hit them with the... Yeah, peace out. <laughs>